in these problems, notice that we're again trying to get our variable by itself. That's always our goal when we're trying to solve an equation. But in each of these equations, notice that your variable has a power that's being taken to. And in all of these, it's actually a squared power. That makes all of these what we call quadratic equations. In, in all of these problems, because there's just a single variable, we just need to get it by itself by undoing whatever functions are there. And the big thing to remember when you're doing a quadratic equation is that the function to undo a squared to undo a squared is to take the square root. Those are the functions that undo each other. So for example, in problem number 10, notice that we have x squared is equal to 36. If we want to undo x squared, what we want to do is take the square root of each side. If you do something to one side of an equation, you have to do it to the other side to keep it balanced. Now. There is a big thing that you kind of need to keep in mind here. Well, so here the square and the square root undo each other, and I'm left with x. And when I take the square root, what I get is the square root of 36 is 6, because 6 times 6 is equal to 36. The problem is, is that there's also another number that will give me 36 if I multiply it by itself. And that is negative 6, because negative 6 times negative 6 would give me a positive 36 as well. And this is something that's going to be true when you're dealing with uh, these squared equations is that we have a possibility of two different answers when we do this. Anytime that you take the square root of both sides, so if you introduce the square root, What you have to remember is that you have two possible solutions at that point. A positive value and a negative value. So at the time that you introduced the square root to each side, you have two possible solutions. So here I took the square root of 36 and I end up with positive or negative 6 as a solution. Let's take a look over here at the next one. Here I want to get the m by itself. The only thing that's going on with it is that it's being squared. So to undo it, I'm going to take the square root of both sides. Here when I take the square root of a square, those undo each other and leave me just with what was involved in the function. So I get just m. On the other side, I took the square root. So at this point, I introduce two possible solutions, a positive square root of 18 and a negative square root of 18. A lot of times you'll see this notation here where you have a plus minus written in front. Keep in mind that what that means is these are two different options. This means the same thing as m equals 18 or m equals negative 18, and they're both valid solutions for my problem. So at the point where we take the square root, we introduce two possible solutions. Now. Generally, we, we would be okay with leaving an answer like this. The problem I have with this solution is that my radical is not simplified. So we do have to go back and remember all of those things that we learned in the first chapter about simplifying expressions and writing your answer in their simplest forms. So the square root of 18, if you go back and remember that, 18 is 3 times 6, 6 is 2 times 3. We've got a pair of 3s. So we can write the square root of 18 as the square root of 9 times the square root of 2. And then we can take the square root of 9, and we end up with 3 times the square root of 2. So when we go to write our final solution, do make sure that your final answers are simplified square roots. So instead of m equals plus or minus the square root of 18, what you'd really like to record for your final answer is m equals either a positive or negative 3 radical 2. This is the best solution that you can use and should be your final solution for your problem. Two possible answers because it was a squared equation, and we get those two possible answers when we take the squared of each side because we introduce that negative possibility because um, the squared takes away uh, any sense of whether the original value is positive or negative because it always makes it positive. Okay, so with that in mind, this is really the key piece that we need to solve any of these equations, but we need to put together everything that we've learned in the, our other chapters as well. 
So for example, here I want to get the x by itself, but there's more stuff going on this time. There's a 10 as well as the squared. Now here, the only thing that's being squared is just the x. So that exponent is going to hold on for a long time in my solution process. But the x is also being multiplied by 10, or the x squared is being multiplied by 10. So I need to get rid of the 10 first. Since it's being multiplied, I'm going to divide both sides by 10. And I'm going to get x squared is equal to 1 fifth. Uh, we'll just, if it doesn't go in evenly, just write it as a fraction. Let's deal with this from a fraction perspective. Now, I want to get the x by itself. It's being squared, so that's the only thing going on. So to undo the square, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the square root of each side. Because I introduced the square root, I introduced two possible answers here. So I'm going to, you know what, I'm going to slide this over a little bit so you can see it better. I had two tenths was one fifth, took the square root of each side, but because I took the square root, I introduced those possibilities of two solutions. On the left, the x squared and the square undo each other and leave me just with x. That was the whole point of doing this. And on the right, I have this plus or minus the square root of one fifth. I don't like this answer because technically the square root, what this really means is the square root of one over square root of five. And I have the square root of one is just one, but the square root of five I can't do. And I end up with a radical in the denominator. So we need to do those rash that rationalize the denominator process uh, if you want to get rid of a square root in the denominator, we can multiply by it both in the top and on the bottom. We end up with plus or minus radical 5 over the square root of 25 on the bottom. And we can take the square root of 25 as just 5. So we would rewrite the square root of 1 fifth as radical 5 over 5 since so we did not have that square root in the denominator. So this is just our commonly accepted best oops, commonly accepted best form um, without that radical in the denominator. So make sure that you think about and process each of what those values are. But this is what we were able to get when x was by itself. Okay, let's take a look at question 13 here. Again, my, I have an x. I want to get it by itself. Lots going on in this problem. Notice that it's 3 times x minus 1. All of that is in parentheses and being squared. So I do need to get rid of the 3 and the 1, but because they are also trapped in the squared, I've got to get rid of the squared first this time in the problem. So you can kind of see the difference between each of these. Here the 10 was outside of the squared, so I had to deal with it first. Here everything else is inside the squared, so the thing that's the farthest away is the squared function. And I get rid of that by taking the square to both sides. On the left, the square root and the square undo each other and leave me with 3x minus 1. On the right, I took the square root, so I get two possible answers, and the square root of 25 is actually equal to 5. So here I get 3x minus 1 equals either a positive 5 or a negative 5. I want to get the x by itself, which means I'm going to have to add 1 to each side and then divide by 3 to finish solving this equation. But the problem is, over here, is I have two things that it could be equal to. What I like to do at this point is go ahead and just rewrite this as two different equations because 3x minus 1 could be 5 or the 3x minus 1 could be negative 5. And I only really, you could do that here, but you're done. Here I still have to do some work to get the x alone, so having those two different equations is really going to be helpful. For the first equation, I can add 1 to each side. 3x is equal to 6 and then divide by 3 on each side and I get x equals 2 as one possible solution. Um, notice if you plug that in here, 3 times 2 is 6, minus 1 is 5, 5 squared is 25. I get back to my original problem. So that solution is one possibility. Over here, remember that the 3x minus 1 could be equal to negative 5, because when I took that square root, I wouldn't know if my answer was positive or negative. So now to get the x by itself, I'm going to add 1 to each side. 3x is equal to negative 4. And then to get the x by itself, since it's times by 3, I'll divide by 3 on each side. And I end up with x equals negative 4 thirds as another sol possible solution. And you can plug that in here. Again, you'd end up with 3 times negative 4 thirds is negative 4, minus 1 is negative 5, negative 5 squared is positive 25. And this solution would also be a valid solution to my equation. 
So still two possible answers, but because the positive and negative showed up in the middle of the problem, I kind of had to break it up into two different, um, two different paths to solve to find my answers. All right, for our last example here with these uh, trying to solve for x, same deal. Um, let's go through what we would need to do in this case. I do have some things inside the squared, so I can't get rid of this 2 till I get rid of the squared. But there is a 3 and an 8 outside of the squared function uh, that are really far away from x, mathematically speaking. So we want to get rid of those first. Again, it, we're always trying to get the x by itself, get rid of anything that's on that same side of the equation. So the weakest link here, again, think of that reverse order of operations, is the plus, or, is the plus 8. So I'm going to uh, subtract 8 from each side in order to get rid of that. That leaves me with 3 times x minus 2 squared equals, on the other side, 32 minus 8 is 24. Now, I still like to get the x by itself. There's a minus 2, a squared, and a times by 3. The 3 is outside of the squared function, so we can get rid of that next. Since it's times by 3, I'm going to divide by 3 on each side. That's going to get me x minus 2 squared equal 24 divided by 3 is 8. So again, I'm just working my way down, undoing every operation in this equation, trying to get that x by itself. At this point, this 2 is inside the squared, so the squared is the next weak link, the farthest away piece that I can do. Um, and so to get rid of a squared, I'm going to take the square root. Here, the square and the square root undo each other, and I'm left with x minus 2. On the right-hand side, I introduce the square root, so I get two possible answers and I have the square root of 8. Keep in mind that the square root of 8 does have a hidden uh, square root inside. Square root of 8 is not as simplified as you can get. Notice that we can break the square root of 8 down into the square root of 4 times the square root of 2, and the square root of 4 is 2. So my writing the solution in its most simplified form, what I end up getting is plus or minus 2 times the square root of 2 on the right-hand side. Now, the x isn't by itself yet, but I have two possible answers on the other side. So go ahead and write this as, you can write this as two different problems. x minus 2 equals 2 square root of 2, or x minus 2 equals negative 2 square root of 2. Now, I want to finish getting x by itself. Since it was minus 2, we add 2 to each side. Since one thing has a square root and the other doesn't, I can't actually add those terms together. They're not like terms. So that is a fine way to write your answer, even if it looks long and complex. On the other side, I have to add 2. This time, it was negative 2 square root of 2 plus 2. Again, not like terms, because this has a square root and this does not. So that's my second solution, and I get those two possible answers for this.